I'm Darla Watanabe. I'm one of the nurse coordinators for the supportive care program here at Stanford, and I want to welcome you to tonight's lecture. I have Dr. Sheila Lahijani with me, and she's going to be talking about sleep and cognition, bedmates, and cancer. Okay, so we'll hold the questions, I think, till the end, if, if that's possible. Um, if you have a pressing questions, by all means, please ask it, but um, we'll give you plenty of time at the end to ask questions, and we'll tell you a little bit more about our program at the very end as well. So again, thank you. Thank you, Darla. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm happy to see all of you here, eager to learn about sleep and cognition and cancer. Um, before I get started, I'd like to see, by a show of hands, which of you in the audience have has had any difficulties with sleep at any point in your lives? Okay. And in terms of your experiences with sleep since either of you were diagnosed with cancer or have undergone treatment for cancer, has anybody noticed it changing at all with, with sleep or has it, was that when it started? Yeah, it, it got worse during the illness. Yeah. Terrible, okay. Well, thanks for offering that because this is why, why I'm here tonight and I hear quite a bit of it um, myself. So. Um, I am the psychiatrist here at the Cancer Center. I oversee the psycho-oncology program, and basically we provide services to patients that are referred by their oncologists uh, when there may be anything that has to be addressed that's social, emotional, behavioral, whatever it may be, we offer consultation services. And I work with a few other colleagues, um, and what I would say is we do spend a lot of time with patients during appointments talking about sleep. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and talk with you. And the overview for tonight's lecture is the following. I'm going to, I'm going to just speak um, to some definitions, uh, speak to sleep, um, what comprises um, sleep, how sleep is related to thinking, different sleep disorders, and how cancer and its treatment can impact sleep, and then some opportunities for treatment and interventions, and then I've uh, included some resources for you as well. And as Darla said, we'll save the questions for the end unless there's something pressing that you'd like to bring to my attention. So I always think it's important to know the history of what we're talking about because it gives us more context um, and it helps us appreciate that this issue of sleep or this phenomenon of sleep has been away for uh, around for quite a while, needless to say. Um, and there's been different stages in, in terms of a quote unquote, the history of sleep. Even the origin of the word um, dates back to Latin roots, uh, German roots, as well as Greek roots. Hippocrates, the known father of medicine, uh, uh, identified sleep to be caused by a retreat of blood vessels and warmth into certain regions of the body, the inner regions of the body. Aristotle, uh, our, a very famous Greek philosopher, as you may know, uh, related sleep to food and its ability to generate heat and cause sleepiness. Paracelsus, who was a Swiss physician, uh, suggested that it's best not to sleep too much and it's best not to sleep too little. And it's good to go to bed at dark and to wake up when it's light. Uh, thereafter, there was a golden age of sleep research uh, when there were correlations found between certain stages, between the stages of sleep and EEG, electroencephalography, which is used primarily for seizures. Um, but the only point of that being is that brain activity was measured. Uh, different scientists later on identified both non-REM and REM sleep, which I'll speak to, uh, changes in muscle tone uh, during sleep. And interestingly, since we're all here at Stanford, the Stanford University Sleep Disorders Clinic was founded in the 70s. So what is human sleep? And so as all of us know, it's, it's periodic, it's reversible, we all wake up from it and we all go, go into sleep with the expectation that um, it's possibly gonna be interrupted. It's a transient state, um, it's a natural state, uh, and there's impaired consciousness, and it affects the way we relate to the external world. So different rhythms, emotions, dreams, etc. And so when we speak about consciousness, what we're speaking about are two major components, awareness as well as arousal. And I included this graph just so that you have an appreciation that all of this really just happens along a con continuum. So some people may look as if they're in very deep sleep and people might express concerns about them. And so it might on the surface appear as if they're not arousable. So patients who may not be conscious, patients who may be in a comatose state or be what's called a persistent vegetative state may appear as if they're asleep, but they're lacking consciousness. That means they're not aware and they're not arousable. 
cycle. This is very different from sleep. But just to keep in mind that there are some potential similarities as it relates to arousal and awareness. So in addition to knowing about the history and really just identifying what the definition of sleep is, it's important to take stock that there's brain chemistry that helps us both wake up as well as fall asleep. And so to the right of this slide, I've identified the neurochemicals in the body that play a major role in wakefulness. So generally speaking for most of us during the daytime hours um, and in the evening time, the ones that are involved uh, with sleep. And interestingly, I'll speak to you about adenosine um, that that's known as a high pressure neuro, uh, high, high sleep pressure neurochemical. And I can speak to that in the next slide. So really what happens is we're exposed to light that's it's transmitted into our eyes, and there's a tract that leads to the brain, leading into a center that's called the SCN, which stands for the supra suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's where the pineal gland is, and that's where melatonin is secreted. Melatonin is the neurochemical involved in regulating circadian rhythm. And so it's important for you to keep in mind that light plays a role. Um, more natural light than this artificial light that I'm staring at, but nonetheless, that could interfere with my sleep if it were later in sleep time for me, um, as well as darkness. And then there are certain things that we'll speak about later that can affect arousal, that can affect sleepiness, um, stages of sleep that may be variable for some people as well. But just keeping in mind that this process is going on every day for all of us. So the main takeaway from this slide, I don't, I don't want to... Um, um, uh, show you something that um, uh, you might, I, basically I want to make this useful to you. So as I mentioned earlier, there are neurochemicals that are involved in the regulation of sleep as well as wakefulness. There's a neurochemical called adenosine, uh, which contributes to high sleep pressure. Uh, and this neurochemical essentially rises over the course of the day. And that's when people start feeling more sleepy late in the afternoon, early into the evening and into the evening. In fact, when people use caffeine products, drink coffee or use energy drinks, caffeine takes the place of adenosine. So essentially combats this high sleep pressure neurochemical in the body. So adenosine plays a really important role both during the daytime and in the evening time, as well as melatonin, which promotes the sleep-wake cycle. Um, so it's just important for you to keep in mind that these are active biological processes that are happening in all of our bodies, particularly our brains. So what's normal sleep? Sleep is composed of two main parts. Uh, there's non-rapid eye movement sleep, so non-REM sleep, which comprises the bulk of sleep time. And then there's rapid eye movement sleep, which is the remainder, about the 25% of the sleep time. When we fall asleep, we're in non-REM sleep. At that point, we have limited mental activity. Our muscles are starting to relax. There may not be as much going on physiologically related to relative to during the daytime hours, our body temperature starts to go down, our heart rate starts to go down, our breathing starts to change, and there's a procession going from stage N1, which is light sleep, to stage N2, which is slow wave sleep, and then stage three, which is deep sleep, the deep sleep per portion of non-REM. And then about a little over an hour later, we're in REM sleep, which is called rapid eye movement sleep. At that point, there's more happening. There's increase in brain activity. There's a number of different physiological processes taking place, which then cause changes in blood pressure, changes in heart rate, changes in breathing, changes in muscle tone, and, and then we also have rapid eye movements throughout that, hence the name REM sleep. Um, and so basically what happens is that these processes are taking place. We start off with non-REM and then we'll proceed over into REM. And over the course of the evening, they basically cycle over every hour and a half or so. And then as the night progresses, we're all in REM sleep. So how do you differentiate all of this? Well, I just made some references. I mean, certainly when we're awake, just like all of you are, you're sitting, you're upright, you're aroused, you're alert, you're paying attention, your muscle tone and your mobility should be generally fairly normal. You're responding to stimuli, my voice, the slides, the lighting in this room. You're alert, as I said, your eyes are open, you have 
normal eye movements. So when you go into non-REM sleep tonight, um, basically you're going to be hopefully in a supine position, recumbent lying down, so your position is going to change. Um, there's going to be some slight changes in your movement because you're going to be going into bed, you might be moving around until you start getting more sleepy and going into the other stages. Um, you're going to be less responsive to different stimuli in your room when you're going to sleep. And you start becoming less alert. You start becoming more unconscious, keeping in mind consciousness is composed of uh, awareness and alertness. So you start becoming less alert, i.e. less conscious, but you're still arousable. Your eyelids are closing and then there's slow rolling of the eyes. And then what happens is you go into rapid eye movement sleep, which I just described. So at that point, there's much more activity, there's changes in heart rate, there's changes in blood pressure, you're much less alert, um, it's much harder to arouse you and to wake you up, your eyelids are closed, and there's rapid eye movements. So now that I've described years and years and years worth of experience in terms of what sleep is and how it's fascinated um, all historians, philosophers, doctors, and continues to do so. And we've defined what sleep is, we've identified what the stages of sleep are, and two of the most important neurochemicals, adenosine and melatonin. I think it's important to discuss then why do we even need sleep, okay? <clears throat> So sleep is really important because it's part of our biology and it's it's very, very vital to our health and our well-being. Um, and our body performs a number of different things while we're asleep, which I referred to not that long ago, among which include repairing DNA, building and repairing muscles and tissues, and also regulating weight. So these functions are all impacted by sleep, including hunger, appetite, hormone levels. There's effects on mood chemicals, so different neurochemicals that affect your emotions, that affect your behavior. Uh, there's processing of memories and tasks, which I'll speak to a little bit later. And there's impact also on your ability to perform complex tasks, higher level brain functioning over the course of the daytime. So all of this is happening over the course of sleep. And without sleep, all of these different body functions are impacted. So then when I speak to the last three, um, three parts of this, what I'm speaking really about is cognition, which is a term that's used quite a bit in medicine. But what does it really mean? Oops, excuse me. So cognition, and I got this from the Oxford English Dictionary because there are plenty to choose from, but I prefer the Oxford English Dictionary. So cognition is an action. It's a mental action. It's a process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, through experience, and through all your senses. That's what cognition is. We're all cognitively awake, alert, and intact right now. Um, and so the functions that are impacted by sleep, the cognitive functions I'm referring to are exactly what I mentioned earlier. The neurochemicals that are involved in mood and behavior, the processing of memory, newly learned tasks, and the ability to perform higher level functioning. So sleep is, is known to play a very important role both in all, in, in all of these as well as neuroplasticity in terms of the elasticity of the nerve cells. So we know that sleep is important and that sleep is important for our biology and for our functioning and we know that it's important for cognition and so what happens when we don't get enough sleep? And so what's known is that people are less quick to respond there's more variability in terms of how likely you may be to pay attention to something, how awake and alert that you are. Um, there's some debate in terms of if there's certain parts of the brain that are affected or if all of the brain is affected. Certain imaging has indicated some changes when people are sleep deprived to what's called the prefrontal cortex, uh, which is involved in higher brain functioning. But then when people have studied this further, the results haven't been consistent, so to speak, but this is certainly an area that can be impacted by sleep deprivation. And evidence suggests that some aspects remain degraded after a period of time, even when people become more alert. So even if you've been deprived of sleep and you're no longer deprived of sleep and you're looking more alert, there may be some ongoing uh, consequences related to cognitive functioning, which is why sleep is so important. Um, and also what's important to our discussion, because we can't talk about sleep and cognition without talking about mood, because it's not unusual for people to get irritable when they're not sleeping well or not sleeping at all. 
And the important thing to keep in mind is that sleep affects cognition and those aspects of cognition that regulate and modulate our emotions too. So if our sleep is impaired, that relates to cognitive impairment and that relates to dysregulation of many of our emotions and our behavior as well. So the National Science, uh, Sleep Foundation is a really great resource and I've included this in the handout tonight and I encourage you to take a look at this website. Um, there's a lot of important education that they offer all of us. Um, the reason why I put this up here is um, because I wanna emphasize the point that age is a factor in terms of how much sleep we all get and how much sleep is recommended, at least by this organization as well as some of the other organizations. And so earlier on, as you know, newborns sleep quite a bit. They sleep throughout the day and other times they're disruptive over the course of the night. And as we all get older and become toddlers and become children, our sleep ranges anywhere, as you can see, from 9 to 12 to 14 hours. And once we start becoming teenagers, that lessens. And in fact, there's a bit of an epidemic in this country, as well as in possibly other countries, where teenagers suffer from major sleep disorders. And so there's a lot that's being looked at in regard to that age group. And then for all of us in the room as adults, and then for those of you who are older adults, um, on average, people tend to sleep less because there are certain changes that take place neurochemically and hormonally which affect that. But roughly speaking, the, org the recommendations by the National Sleep Foundation are that we all sleep anywhere from seven to eight hours. And so what happens when we don't get that sleep and what happens when we're impaired? So it partly depends on what it's being caused by. So the way I keep things organized for myself is thinking about if something is caused on its own, happens spontaneously, and doesn't have any other associated cause like any other medical problem or psychiatric problem, substances which clearly can affect the brain and impact sleep. So those would be what's called primary uh, sleep disorders, ones that essentially happen on their own, are not associated with any medical or psychiatric problems, or don't have any other cause, so to speak, not are caused by any substances. Whereas secondary sleep disorders are related to medical problems, medical diagnoses such as cancer, psychiatric symptoms, psychiatric diagnoses, and or substances. This is a simplification just so that you can understand that there is a range of sleep disorders. Most commonly, when people are sleep deprived and suffer from sleep disorders, they suffer from what's called insomnia, which you've all heard about, and it's a diagnosis that we commonly make for patients, and I commonly make for a lot of patients that I see. So what's insomnia? So it's a subjective experience of having a hard time falling asleep, having a hard time staying asleep, or having difficulty in the morning, meaning you're waking up, having difficulty falling back asleep, or it's not restorative enough. And it has to be associated with distress, meaning an uncomfortable, unpleasant experience, or it has to cause some impairment in your daytime functioning. There's a recent requirement in terms of its diagnosis that it has to happen at least three nights per week. So if you have one bad night of sleep, you're not suffering from insomnia. So it has to happen at least three nights a week. Some people unfortunately suffer way longer than that for at least a month, if not longer, and that's called chronic insomnia. And when that affects other aspects of your life, uh, in addition, you know, so other aspects of your functioning, whether it's socially, function, uh, socially, excuse me, occupationally, behaviorally, that may qualify for a diagnosis of chronic insomnia. Acute insomnia is what I see quite a bit. When people are initially diagnosed with cancer or there's changes in their health status, meaning that they're either feeling worse or there's new medications or new treatment that started or you're in the hospital and you can't sleep or you've just undergone a surgery, whatever it may be, and I'll speak to that too, but oftentimes people are calling, uh, suffering from acute insomnia. And this last line is really, really important. Um, in this country, about 30% of adults suffer from insomnia, but those people who have cancer or anyone who suffers from a cancer illness experience may suffer from a sleep disorder. At least there's a 50% prevalence. And so much more than the general population, and there are a number of different reasons for that, and I can speak to you about that as well. Um, the next slide refers to the different diagnostic criteria, which I already went over, so we don't necessarily need to spend time on this. But just for you to take 
note of, there's a manual called the DSM-5, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's the manual that the American Psychiatric Association uses to define certain disorders and uh, provide criteria for diagnosis. And so th those are the criteria to officially diagnose insomnia based on that organization. Other types of sleep disorders are the following. So patients can also suffer from sleep disordered breathing, and that's diagnosed by seeing a sleep medicine consultant, in which case you would undergo a sleep study. They determine if you're having any breathing difficulties, et cetera. One example of that is obstructive sleep apnea, which some people can suffer from. And in fact, I've referred a number of patients from my clinic to the sleep clinic here, and people have gotten diagnosed with OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. So it should be part of what we call the differential diagnosis. Some people may have hypersomnolence disorder that in spite of sleeping at least seven hours a night, they're still very sleepy over the course of the day and that also warrants further evaluation. And then some people have disruptions to their day and night cycle, their circadian rhythm, and they're off. So in other words, they sleep during the day, but they're awake over the course of the night. Oftentimes this is seen with people who have um, night shift work, who work overnight. Sometimes it happens for other reasons. I mean, when I reflect back to when I was in medical training, it was prior to when there were all these duty hour regulations and there was a couple there were a couple of shifts where I worked at least 30 hours and certainly my sleep was disrupted for majority of my residency and for many doctors who still continue to take call or any other folks who have jobs that require them to be awake and alert overnight they they can develop what's called a circadian rhythm sleep disorder Likewise, if you're not sleeping well in the hospital or you're not sleeping well at home and you're more sleepy during the day, your circadian rhythm is disrupted. Getting back to the initial diagram I showed you. Then there's another disorder called parasomnias. And this is interesting because what happens is people wake up and they have unusual behaviors or they have unusual experiences while they're asleep and they've just woken up and it's hard for them to go back asleep and it affects their sleep. And that also warrants and requires further evaluation. Although clinically at the cancer center, I, I haven't seen that with any patient, but it's good to keep that in mind. And then sleep related movement disorder, which many people may complain of, part of it is just natural based on what I shared with you. There's changes in muscle tone that take place during different stages of sleep. But when it becomes more persistent or it becomes more abnormal, so to speak, during different stages of sleep, people may have what's called a sleep-related movement disorder. And something like that would be restless leg syndrome for which treatment is needed. So sleep disorders can increase the risk of other medical problems. So whether you have cancer or not, and you suffer from a sleep disorder, you're at increased risk for other medical illnesses. So that's why, as I mentioned earlier, getting good restorative sleep is so important. And so sleep problems and sleep disorders are associated with the following. So people can develop more obesity because there's changes in a number of different hormones and neurochemicals which affect appetite. Specifically, there's a reduction in leptin and an increase in what's called ghrelin, which causes an increase in appetite. All of this is associated with worsening blood sugar, so people can develop diabetes because their blood sugar is not well regulated, or be also in, um, have, a, uh, have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, which could in include um, uh, strict um, uh, uh, the blood vessels of the heart being impacted, um, being at increased risk for a heart attack or a stroke. And interestingly, as we know, as I mentioned earlier, that sleep disorders can also cause and contribute to mood disorders in and of themselves because there's such an interplay between neurochemicals and hormones. As well, people who suffer from pain or experience pain can have a worsening of their pain symptoms and syndromes when they're not sleeping well. And likewise, when people don't have pain, if they're impaired from not having sleep, they can develop new pain symptoms and new ways of experiencing things that other Otherwise, we're not distressing to them physically. And we already spoke to cognitive impairment. And then I included this last line just because there's all this stuff out there that we as doctors come across and that we come across in the, in the, in the press and such about not having sleep or not doing X or not doing Y causes sleep. As many studies as, as, there, as have been done, there's no 
direct cause and effect. So in other words, if you're sleep deprived, it's not gonna cause cancer, so to speak. It's not been clearly delineated, but it does affect immunity and it does affect the, your, your body's ability to fight stuff off. So while it, there's no cause and effect and while no one's responsible for having caused himself or herself cancer, there are such an interplay of, um, of neurochemicals and hormones, as I mentioned, as well as immunity, that it can potentially make you more susceptible to things. But I, I dispute um, whatever's out there in terms of people saying that, you know, so-and-so sleep disorder contributed to so-and-so developing cancer. We all can have our own beliefs, but um, it's important to keep in mind the other ones that I mentioned as being based on evidence. So really, the the Everything that I've spoken with you thus far applies to all of us, and it particularly applies to those of you who have cancer or your loved ones who have cancer. And so specifically, I wanna speak about that as well, because there are certain aspects of patients um, who have cancer or who undergo treatment and have sleep problems that warrant a review. So again, when people suffer from sleep disorders, when they're also diagnosed with cancer and are undergoing cancer treatment, it might affect people's ability to fall asleep, stay asleep, their ability to wake up and go back to sleep, or wake up and feel rested. And again, as I mentioned, it's associated with sleep deprivation and impairment in sleep is associated with worsening pain, worsening fatigue, depression, anxiety, and what's called vasomotor symptoms, so something like hot flashes as well. And insomnia, interestingly, can affect patients even years after the treatment of the cancer. So it's a problem that can persist even after people complete their treatment for the cancer. And another important uh, concept or topic to emphasize here is what's called cancer-related fatigue. The statistics show a prevalence of about 80%. So meaning 80% of people who have a diagnosis of cancer complain of fatigue. And what qualifies as cancer-related fatigue is that it's persistent, it doesn't go away, and it's not correlated with your activity or your rest, meaning you could be doing very little and feel very fatigued, and you could be getting plenty of rest and still very, feel very fatigued. And this is very closely correlated to how your sleep is going to be impacted as well. And so insomnia and fatigue, as it relates to patients with cancer, it's very poorly identified, i.e. it's very poorly diagnosed and it's poorly treated. And in large part, it's because many people don't complain about this. Uh, in terms of some of the papers and the literature that I've reviewed and uh, you know, having read about this quite a bit, less than 20% of people bring this up to their providers. And so this is one area that uh, people can, can really advocate for themselves because it affects so much. And, and, and it's something that can be addressed um, quite well too, um, particularly here where we have so many resources available. So um, I'll speak to that a little bit later. And then there's been some, some, some discussion and some studies about people with certain kinds of cancer being more likely to complain. Well, you know, I relate that to how much does the cancer affect one's functioning. So people who have genital urinary cancers, if that's affecting your ability to urinate or not urinate or it's causing any pain or any sort of physical difficulty, it might affect your ability to fall asleep, stay asleep, it might cause disruptions. Likewise, gynecologic cancers, head and neck cancers, blood cancers, but in my opinion, this can affect everybody, any kind of cancer. But this is some of the ones that have been brought up in some of the reviews. And so what are the risk factors as it relates to someone who has cancer and might be suffering from sleep? So age is important, as we've already talked about. And if you already had sleep problems going into the illness experience, then you're at higher risk. And I, I know before I started, there was a couple of folks that indicated that they, they had some sleep problems even before. So that's really important to offer to your doctors and to your medical team because it means you already had an underlying sleep disorder. And if anything, it'll probably get worse. So that you can get appropriately um, supported and treated. Other factors, so certain chemotherapy regimens, certain medica medications that are used for nausea, steroids, 
hormones, when people are hospitalized, when people undergo surgery or experience pain or have mood problems or what's called delirium, which basically means you have a difficulty sustaining your attention, you're kind of, your, co your consciousness is kind of in and out, you might be having dis um, disorientation, not know where you are, not w know what's happening, potentially be having what's called perceptual disturbances, either be hallucinating, seeing things that may not be there, hearing things that might not necessarily be in your head. So all of those things by themselves or in combination can worsen your risk for having a sleep problem. And, and this is particularly relevant because for anyone who's suffering from any kind of cancer, you're likely going to be put on any combination of these medications and these can be very disruptive to your sleep cycle. So factors, you know, I, I tend to look at things that what's what's kind of a fixed factor and what's not. So certain things in terms of chemotherapy regimens, there's no there are no better options, there's standard of care, there's certain medicines that are administered to treat your symptoms, even if they may disrupt your sleep. If, you, if someone has to be hospitalized or if someone has to go to surgery, I mean, certain things are fixed, or at least one chooses to get those things done. But other things can actually be addressed or can be worked on, and, and quite frankly, this is a lot of what I spend my time when I meet with patients who are suffering from sleep problems, and we can speak about this. Um, I have uh, you know, about 10 more slides and I can speak more towards how sleep is evaluated and treated, but this is what I wanted to start off with, is that oftentimes it relates to people having poor sleep habits to begin with. And there's, you know, there are different ways that that can be defined, but it really just speaks to what are you doing, you know, over the course of the day? What are you eating? What are you drinking? And particularly as it gets later into the evening, is there anything that's disrupting you? Are there any stimuli? Um, are you spending an excessive amount of time in bed without actually sleeping? Is your sleep-wake cycle disrupted? Are you napping too much? Are there activities in the bedroom that are causing disruption? What are your beliefs and your attitudes? Do you have all of these negative thoughts and ideas about sleep that's only going to make things worse? And do you have certain expectations of when you should go to sleep and how much you should sleep? Um, when I, you know, th at that point where I've, I've, not, uh, I've made about activities in the bedroom, I, years ago I worked with some sleep medicine specialists uh, in their clinic, and I will always remember, and I've heard this said uh, and written elsewhere, that, this, that the bedroom is only for sleep and or sex, nothing else. And I, I tend to say this quite a bit to patients, and sometimes it causes a chuckle, and other times people blush or they turn away. But this is what our sleep medicine experts say. So anything else that could be stimulating or that could be taking your attention away from the actual act of falling asleep or staying asleep um, should be considered as, as a interference. So, so I've included these in the slides, and you can take a look at these. I don't necessarily have to go through everything, but in terms of how to properly evaluate sleep, you can do it, family members can do it, spouses can do it, and what's really important is to identify what your patterns are. When are you going to bed? How long are you staying in bed? Do you wake up? How many times do you wake up? How long do you stay awake before falling asleep? When do you wake up in the morning? Do you stay in bed longer than when you, when you should? or do you get up immediately? All of these things are important. Do you nap during the day? Um, are there certain foods that you're having uh, at certain times of the day, particularly later in the day that might be affecting you? Some, some foods that are um, associated with worse sleep, certainly caffeine, because it could be very stimulating. Again, keeping in mind what I mentioned earlier, it takes the place of adenosine, that neurochemical, which can increase the sleep pressure. So caffeine's gonna make you more stimulated, interfere. There's some information about foods that are high in carbohydrates and fats and spice that could interfere. Foods that may help, cherries, which have melatonin, milk, sources of tryptophan, which is what um, is melatonin's precursor which is why a lot of people after next month's Thanksgiving dinner are gonna pass out. Um, and then other medical conditions that can contribute to insomnia, such as cancer, as I just spent time talking about. And so uh, what do you do? Keep a diary. If, if you take anything away in terms of tips, this is one of the biggest ones today, is to keep a log of your sleep patterns. And generally, it's recommended that you do it for about a week to two weeks so that you have enough nights um, to provide uh, in terms of the visit. 
and then for you to kind of pick up on what you could be potentially doing differently or what may be helping or what might be inter uh, interfering. So keep a sleep diary or a sleep log. Um, there are also sleep questionnaires, some of which are sleep uh, self, excuse me, self-administered, or some of which are administered in the clinical settings. I think these are helpful. They've been studied. Some of them are more valid than others, but most importantly, keep your sleep log. There are certain devices that are actually worn on the wrists um, as a way of um, monitoring your movements when you're falling asleep and asleep, and they estimate certain parameters of sleep, and then they can uh, make some estimations in terms of your patterns. There are other wearable devices. We're all in Silicon Valley. There's a lot that we can potentially have access to, but you know, in terms of the data, it's, it's variable. Um, and you could also consider being referred to the Sleep Medicine Center. Which brings me to my next slide. Um, so our clinic here, it's, it's through the Department of Psychiatry, but um, what I would like to say is these are sleep medicine experts. So they're um, largely all MDs, they're also PhDs, um, and they do different kinds of studies and evaluations to come up with whatever may be the problem or the cause, and then determine if you need further studies, whether it's gonna be done at home or if it's gonna be done in the clinical setting. In my opinion, um, if you have a, con a complaint or a concern about your sleep and your providers have offered you different kinds of interventions, whether it's medication or non-medication, it's worthwhile to consider even getting a consultation visit with this, with this group of providers. Um, schedules are variable, sometimes there are insurance barriers and whatnot, but I think at the very least it could provide you with an additional, sorts of, additional sort of expertise and education in terms of what can be done if you're suffering from a sleep problem or sleep disorder. <clears throat> And a lot of what they do, and by they I mean sleep medicine experts, is what's on this slide. And so I'll speak about medications separately because it's a little bit of a controversy and, and taboo, but it's still important for us to talk about medicines. But I want to focus in on the non-medication intervention. So a lot of it involves sleep hygiene, and that term is not as sexy as it once used to be, so now it's called sleep tips or sleep education, but I still throw out sleep hygiene, so whatever you want to call it is fine with me. Um, but what is that about? So it's basically coming up with a ritual, and part of what I discuss with patients is every night before you go to bed, identify a part of your house outside of the bedroom and allocate a certain amount of time, if it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, however long it is, and dedicate that time to maybe thinking about the day, thinking about how things went, conversations you had, whatever went well, what didn't go well, what you're anticipating about the next day, what your plans are, maybe you know, involve um, if, you know, setting up your medicines if you have to take your medicines, but really just save some time before you physically start getting for bed outside of your bedroom to kind of get into this momentum of needing to go to sleep. And then you go about doing whatever your other rituals are in terms of self-care, brushing your teeth, whatever it may be, and then physically entering in the bedroom. Because part of what that does is really give you structure, and that's a lot of what we're talking about here because our bodies love structure, and when there's disruption to some sort of structure or balance, you know, things start to take effect. Um, and in addition to that, a lot of what happens at night when people are having difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep is that they're thinking about stuff. People are thinking about stuff. We all do that. We're thinking about the day. We're thinking about the next day. We're thinking about anything under the sun. And so procuring a certain space in your, in your house or setting up what's called a nightly ritual or routine can be very helpful. And then avoiding some of the things I mentioned earlier that could be disruptive. And this really just creates some healthy practices. There's relaxation training, which can help relax your muscles. Some people even undergo hypnotherapy or hypnosis. That's not something that's standard um, or commonly prescribed, but it's, it's an available. Um, and then there's, a, there's a, a practice of sleep restriction. So basically, if you're in bed and you're not sleeping, get up. Don't really lay there. And the hope is that you'll, get, you'll develop what's called a sleep deprivation. And so you, get, you sleep while you're in, in the bed, but you limit, limit that time, and then you get up so that you're not there while you're awake. And then over time, the expectation and the hope is that you'll spend more and more time um, when you get more sleepy, so you're not just kind of hanging around in the bed. 
Um, and the last row is really important. It's called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, CBTI. And it's the same premise as it would be for cognitive behavioral therapy for anything else. A lot of times cognitive behavioral therapy is, is prescribed and recommended for anxiety. And what it helps you do is really identify what the relationships are between your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors. That interplay is going on all the time. And it's not the thoughts that are healthy, the ones that make you feel good, or the ones that lend themselves to you doing constructive, productive things. It's the ones that are either negative, that kind of just come into your mind, the emotions that are uncomfortable, unpleasurable, like anger, irritability, sadness, and then seeing how that impacts the way that you act. This is particularly customized for people who suffer from sleep disorders and insomnia, and that's when it's called CBTI. And it's a way of looking at what your patterns of thinking are, are related to sleep and coming up with new ways of restructuring those thoughts and those ideas as a way of helping you sleep better. And it works quite well, it works quite a bit. We actually have clinicians who administer it. There are courses and programs at our institution. So as we conclude, we've talked about a number of things that could be helpful for sleep. Um, other recommendations also include exercise, regular exercise. It can help with the core body temperature and help you relax. Um, it might be helpful in um, falling asleep as well as staying asleep. There's evidence to support the use of yoga, mindfulness, meditation, as well as sun and light therapy, even vitamin D supplements, which we talked about, which um, we talked about uh, melatonin already, uh, which regulates the circadian rhythm, the day and night cycle. There are certain herbs, such as valerian root or chamomile, which help people fall asleep. There are certain homeopathic agents. And then some of the East Asian cultures, particularly Chinese medicine, has their own ideas and perceptions um, about um, insomnia and sleep. And a lot of it's um, about qi, so the different kind of energy related to sleep. Acupuncture has been identified to be helpful. There are certain pressure points that are associated with sleep and white noise machines, which I commonly recommend and prescribe. You can get it like for like $15 from Amazon or Bed Bath Beyond, and it really just helps with the relaxation component and helping people fall asleep. So then, as we conclude, I can't speak about sleep without talking about sleep medicines because this comes up all the time and people ask me about sleep medicines all the time and sometimes they come in on medicines that other doctors have prescribed them and either I'm like, oh, that's okay, or, or other times I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so bottom line is medications can be helpful, but what's really important to keep in mind is that they require monitoring for safety as well as efficacy, meaning how effective they are in, as, you know, in whatever low dose is possible. And attention should also be given, again, like I mentioned, to how long they're used. And so choices in terms of sleep medicines should be based on the following factors. So really, who are you? What kind of sleep issue are you experiencing or complaining of? Um, how old are you? What's your gender? Because that can affect certain absorption of different medicines and metabolism. Do you suffer from other medical problems such as cancer? What other medicines are you on that could potentially interact? And then are you a woman of reproductive age, in which case certain medicines are not safe to be used? And then what's your schedule like? What kind of work do you do? Do you work during the day? Do you work at night? Are you someone like that likes to stay up at certain hours or get up at certain hours? These are all really important. There's not a one size fits all when it comes to medicines. And then what I like to do is feed more than one bird with one feeder, so to speak. Um, in, in other words, I'd like, I'd like, I usually like to minimize the pill burden as much as possible. People who are on different chemotherapeutic agents, anti-nausea agents, et cetera, et cetera, pain agents, you don't need any more medicines. But if there's a medicine that could address more than one complaint or problem, I think it's worth a shot as long as there are no other outstanding issues. So I've included four particular examples of that. By examples, I mean certain complaints. So sometimes people develop neuropathy or neuropathic pain related to certain chemotherapies. That's the numbness and tingling that's caused in your nerve endings in your hands and your feet. There are certain medicines that could be particularly helpful for that. One of which is Neurontin, and another is called uh, Elevil. 
These medicines can also make you sleepy. So sometimes I recommend trialing something like that. And these are just examples just to give you an idea or to give you an idea of what else is possible. Um, itching, so two medicines that could help with itching and also help you fall asleep. One of them is called doxepin. Another one is called hydroxazine. I actually use these quite a bit, even when people don't have itching because they're quite effective for sleep and they don't have the side effects that some of the over-the-counter medications have um, because a lot of those include Benadryl and I'll get to that in the next slide. And then Zyprexa, olanzapine, is also used for nausea and it can also be used for sleep as well as appetite. Low appetite and poor sleep can be treated by a medicine called Remeron or Mirtazapine. Again, these don't work for everybody, but I'd like to, I always like to take account of what other symptoms people are having, what other kinds of suffering people are having, because there might be one medicine that could treat more than one complaint or symptom. So these are examples of different medications used for sleep. <clears throat> As per other disorders and conditions, there are some that are approved by the FDA and then some that are not approved but are used as what we call in medicine, quote unquote, off-label. Um, and so there are a number of agents, some of which I, a couple of which I mentioned in the previous slide. And then there are over-the-counter medications such as Benadryl or Unisom. Oftentimes these medicine these medicines work on histamine. They make you very sleepy. They can also make you very groggy. Um, so I want you to keep in mind, particularly for those of you who already have certain side effects from some of your other treatments and some of your other medications, that some of these medicines can make them worse and particularly cause things like sedation, confusion, dryness of your mucosal membranes, urinary retention, they could make you constipated. So while they might help you sleep, they might be associated with other side effects. So definitely keep those in mind. So in summary, <laughs> Sleep is really important, needless to say, and, it's, and, I hope, and I hope if you weren't convinced before, you're convinced right now. It's vital to health and your welfare and healthy living. Uh, patients who have cancer suffer quite a bit from sleep problems, more so than the general population, yet people are less inclined to complain to their providers about their sleep difficulties. If you have sleep difficulties, tell your teams. Let them know. Let them know you need help, you need to feel better, you want to feel better, Hopefully you learned a bunch of stuff tonight or you can take some of the information that I gave you and say this, 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 and that. Help me feel better. Keep a sleep diary. Um, that's one of the most important things that you can do as an advocate for yourselves. And when it comes to cognition, remember the old adage, sleep on it. There's a lot going on while you're sleeping. So keep in mind that sleep is healthy for you in terms of memory, learning, et cetera. And so generally the recommendation by sleep medicine specialists is not to take medicines at the first go to consider the non-medication interventions, but that medications are available. And just like I mentioned in the previous slide that they should be taken with caution and it should be very much tailored to what the problem is that you're suffering from. Melatonin can be taken, it comes in as low as a dose as one milligram and as high as a dose as about nine or 10 milligrams in the outpatient setting. And really when you take it at night, the recommendation is that you take it around eight o'clock because that's the time when it's released at most from that gland in the brain. So when you're taking it in the pill form, you're essentially adding to that amount and that's going to regulate the day and night cycle better. And you can start with the lowest dose possible if that's going to be helpful to you. Some of them are immediate release. Some people find that it better benefits them. Other people find that it doesn't. Interestingly, in the hospital, we use it quite a bit too because it has some association with being an anti-inflammatory agent. It might help with pain um, as well as have antioxidant properties. And when we see patients who are suffering from what's called delirium, we use melatonin quite a bit because people have disrupted sleep-wake cycles. So I use this medicine, um, this natural drug, I should say, all the time. And again, be aware about what sleep aids are available. Consider being referred to a sleep study if you think it's gonna be important. And while I hadn't mentioned this earlier, I just wanted to make sure I included it in the summary. Caregivers who are um, related or unrelated, taking care of those that they love with cancer or any, any uh, they suffer too, and, and you all may already know that, but sleep problems are rampant among sleep, among caregivers, and patients can um, not only suffer from it, but their caregivers can suffer from it. So it's important to you know take note of that too, and to know that there are so many options available and you don't have to suffer. So just let your doctors know so that you can get the help that you need and hopefully you can feel better and, and sleep better.
Okay, so these are resources um, for sleep and sleep disorders. There are plenty available online. These are not quote unquote specific to cancer. Certain other institutions like MD Anderson, Dana Farber, and Mayo Clinic have specific websites as it relates to patients who have cancer, but quite frankly, it's all the same. It's everything that we've discussed tonight. These are some general resources. And then I wanted to make sure I offered you resources for cancer support as well, which includes our program, which is the second to last link. And that's it for tonight. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Uh, always had, from the day I was born, well, I was born, paradoxical reactions to certain medications. When I was having, I had to have my wisdom teeth drilled out in the hospital because they actually were growing this way and that way into the, and they gave me like Nemutol or Secanol to prep me for, ther for the surgery, and I was on the ceiling. So in order to sedate me, it was like falling from a skyscraper. It was a terrible experience because I was, instead of being sleepy from the sleep medicine, I was crazy from it. Mm -hmm. And also other medications like the zines, mm -hmm. Compazine, I had seizure, mm -hmm. Thorazine, I was, I don't know, I kind of got weird. Then they mixed um, Valium with um, Demerol, I had scary clowns dancing over my, I mean, mm. I'm scared of, of messing with certain drugs. Melatonin, more my style because, it's, you know, uh, and so I wouldn't want to take any, um, also I, I have had sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm. And when my mother died and they gave me medicines, which were serotonin things, you know, reuptake inhibitors, I had sleep paralysis, but at the same time, it really, I was really paralyzed where I couldn't draw air. It, was, it seemed like hours of terror. I know it only lasts a few minutes, mm -hmm. but what can you do for somebody like that? Well, I really appreciate you sharing that because it sounds like you've, you've suffered from different treatments and there's certain experiences you've had along the way. What you're pointing out is what's called paradoxical reactions. I mean, you're pointing out a number of things, but some people can have reactions that are opposite to what's expected or what, what, what's hoped for. And um, some of the medicines that I included in that slide can, uh, can contribute to that for a variety of reasons, some of which are not really confirmed. And oftentimes it happens when people are older. And so something like Ambien, I've seen it happen quite a bit. Um, it could happen for people at other stages in their lives. I started when I was a child. Yeah, so it might be your brain structure, it might be your anatomy, it might be your neurochemistry, and I mean that very respectfully, but let that, in, let that inform you, right? Because that means there are other things that potentially could be offered to you or could be offered to you and with the mantra that we always say in medicine, starting low and going very slowly. The other thing that you're pointing out is what sounds like a delirium. Some of the medicines you mentioned, even by themselves, they can. So some of the nausea medications, the Valium, the Demerol, these can cause delirium in it of themselves. And then when you combine them, right? Yeah. So you know that history about yourself. So when you were, if you are to complain of any sleep difficulties or problems, include that as well when you talk to your provider. And then secondly, if you haven't had a sleep study before, I think it would be important for you to have one and to discuss that with your, with your doctors. <laughs> I'm here now, so. <laughs> I, I was almost crying because uh, I, I have all these things, and it's hard for, for people that I'm, uh, I'm not trying to be a difficult patient. I want to cooperate, but some things happen to me. Mm -hmm. And I would really, do you see patients? I do. Can I have your card? Sure. In fact, I don't know if I have my card with me, but I can give you the number for our clinic. Um, if you're, and I can give that to you. It's not in the if, it's definite. <laughs> so you can call the main cancer center, or if you're, ac the, the way our program is set up right now is we're seeing patients who are, who are actively undergoing care or treatment within the cancer center and patients who are established with Stanford oncologists. Yeah. As we continue to build and grow our program, 
Yeah, so have Dr. Sledge refer you. That's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. you yeah, you can use my health. You know what I, I'm also, because I'm 74, I'm a direct, I'm much better for I, I can't get through on the phone, I just go in. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to do that. And, and and the way our program works is we need to have referrals from, from your doctors. No, I'll get, yeah. I'll get it. Yeah, I'll we'd be happy to see you and see what we can do to help. Yeah. Okay? Well, so yes. Good for you. And you have all those resources I provided you tonight as well to take a look at. Yes, sir. You can just sit if you'd like. I'll stand aside so you can film it. I've had a, a lifelong uh, severe psoriasis, mm. uh, generalized. And my question is, is there a relationship to sleep depriva deprivation and an autoimmune disease such as psoriasis mm -hmm. and a propensity for mm -hmm. it? You know, so I, I really appreciate that question. So I'm, a, I'm trained as both an internist and a psychiatrist, and my subspecialty is what's called psychosomatic medicine or CL psychiatry. My interest and expertise is looking at the interplay between medical disorders and psychiatric symptoms and disorders. And by psychiatric, I mean whatever's going on with the brain, okay? It doesn't necessarily have to be mood symptom. And so we see patients all the time with a number of different medical illnesses, even autoimmune disorders that have changes in their sleep, that have changes in their mood. So while I can't speak to a particularly specific link between psoriasis and a sleep disorder, what I can say is there are a number of what's called inflammatory markers, um, autoimmune factors, um, uh, what's called cytokines, et cetera, et cetera, that are all affected by sleep, by sleep deprivation, um, by certain medical illnesses. And so, to, in short, my answer to your question is yes. Can I speak to a specific link? No, because it's just too complicated. Um, and I would say even just your physical suffering from it in and of itself is a risk factor for having sleep difficulty and whatever might be going on in terms of your skin as well. And so there's what's happening internally as well as what's happening in externally. One is, one, you can't look at one without the other. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, it, it causes stress to the body. It affects the homeostasis. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Lajani, I have two parts. Uh, you mentioned the sleep-related movement disorders and restless leg, leg syndrome is one. What are some other common ones? Also, when you talked about CBTI, uh, you briefly mentioned common cognitive disorders. If you could just elaborate on what some of those might be. What was the last piece of this second uh, question? When you introduce, when you mentioned CBTI, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that there are some cogni common cognitive distortions about sleep. Right. Uh, if you could elaborate on that, Sure. Please. I'll start with your second one. Um, so people, all of us, but particularly when you're suffering from distress, and distress is a general term that describes something that's unpleasant and uncomfortable. So it could come in the form of anxiety. It could come in the form of sadness, whatever it may be. And so when you're suffering from sleep, and you already have difficulty with sleep, there are already automatically some ongoing thought processes about it. There are patterns in, think in thinking, one being something like catastrophic thinking, like if I can't sleep tonight, I'm never going to sleep, or magnifying a particular problem that you have on one particular night or a couple of particular weeks and saying that, you know, you have the worst sleep problem or the sleep disorder or you're not going to get better. In other words, there are certain patterns of thinking that go alongside with your distress related to sleep that can be addressed, that can be explored, and that could be restructured. And that's what I was really speaking to. So when I speak to common, um, I'm generally referring to the ones that... Um, 
cause distress. In other words, you're looking at it in such a way that it's negatively impacting you. And when you think about cognitive restructuring, you're essentially putting another frame around that thought. So, you know, any picture that we look at, it's going to look different when you put a different frame around it or when you explore what supports that way of thinking and what doesn't support that way of thinking. In other words, you're trying to test the evidence for those kinds of thoughts. Okay, does that answer your question? Um, and your first question was whatever, whatever. To, yeah. So there, there are minor ones. There are ones that potentially are related to other medical conditions and disorder. I mean, sometimes people can develop Parkinsonism from certain medications in and of itself that could get worse over the course of the night or sleep. The most common one really is restless leg syndrome. The other ones are are not as common to really speak to. Um, oftentimes, you know, they can be attributed to other medications as well, or or what I mentioned with restless leg. Sometimes. Um, there's, there are a number of different explanations for that, but there, it, it's, there's a relationship between iron um, I, and your blood. Um, so uh, I think largely what to keep in mind is what what is it that your what is your illness? What are the medicines that you're getting? And what's the nature of your of your movement? There's something called myoclonus or myoclonic jerks that naturally happens when people are falling asleep anyway. Sometimes certain medications can also make that worse too. So that would be qualified as another one. Um, but in terms of a proper diagnosis, that's the one that's most commonly seen at night. Any other questions? your microphone. Oh, thank you. Okay. My daughter has had a sleep disorder since she was 14, and she's now in her 30s. I'm just wondering if CB, is it cognitive behavioral CBTI. therapy? Yes, mm -hmm. CBTI mm -hmm. would be something to consider for her. I, I think it's a really good option because over the course of her 16 years of suffering, she's most certainly developed certain patterns of thinking and certain, certain distortions as it relates to her sleep. And so it's, it's not... The, the point with cognitive behavioral therapy, whether it relates to insomnia or it relates to any other kind of distress, it's not to dismiss or invalidate what's happening meaning the complaint or the symptoms associated with it, whether it's emotional or psychological. It's really a, an opportunity or a way of exploring it further, understanding it further, looking at what supports it and what doesn't support it. So she may have, a, 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 I mean, she has a sleep disorder, I mean, by definition, based on what you told me. And it's, it'd be important to know what's underlying that sleep disorder. Is there something structural that's going on? Is there something else neurochemically that needs to be addressed? Well, she's also a type 1 diabetic. Right. And she, so, you know, juvenile diabetes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, have there been other alterations in terms of, you know, her neurochemistry, her mood, but CBTI, I think, is, is worth a shot for a lot of folks because you're inevitably going to develop these kinds of thing, th thoughts about, about your distress. So there could be a, a successful treatment for mm -hmm. someone like her that doesn't involve medication, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think it's multifactorial. I mean, it's clearly she's been suffering for, you know, the great majority, I mean, at least half of her life. And so I would say she warrants a further evaluation to see if other testing is needed, if she needs some sort of device, so to speak. Some people need to be on what's called a CPAP if they're diagnosed with an obstructive sleep apnea. You know, body habitus is also very important, too. That's That oftentimes come up when people suffer from sleep apnea. Can some of it be addressed by, you know, diet, by exercise, by meditation, by mindfulness? But CBTI is on the table. I, I can't necessarily speak to if that's going to remediate it completely, but it should help. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say one thing. My father used to give patients who have restless leg disorder iron. Mm -hmm. It was 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. how, how is that related? Um, it's the, the physiology of it is not clear, but we check it when we need to diagnose it. There's something called ferritin, which is an, a, an inflammatory marker that's increased um, when patients have restless leg syndrome. Um, I, at this point, it's not part of the, the treatment. It's not part of the standard of treatment, but it's checked. There are other medicines that are used that affect a different neurochemical called uh, dopamine um, that's standard of care for restless legs. They didn't know all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. 
simple. It is neat. There's a lot we can learn from the past. Yes, uh, you mentioned sleep disorder. You mentioned cancer. I personally don't think I have a sleep disorder. Mm -hmm. But my sleep pattern for the last maybe 20 years is I sleep about four and a half to five hours a day, mm -hmm. and I get by. Mm -hmm. And I don't uh, need sleep during the day. I, I function quite well. Uh, however, the past four and a half years, I've come down with cancer. And I'm still being treated with cancer mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, but my sleep pattern is still four and a half to five hours a day. Mm -hmm. And it's a really deep sleep. Mm -hmm. My spouse says that by the time my head hits the pillow, I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally unaware of anything until four and a half, five hours later. And I'm wide awake. Mm -hmm. And I could get by with that mm -hmm. seven days a week. It sounds like it's restorative sleep for you, too. Yeah. So biology is important. So you yeah. don't sound like you have a sleep disorder because you're sleeping. Yes. <laughs> you're sleeping. You're functioning. Um, you're not having problems falling asleep. You're not waking up with any interruptions. So you wouldn't you wouldn't have that diagnosis, so to speak. Yeah. You sound like someone who biologically doesn't need as much sleep. And so there's you know certainly variability. There right. are recommendations, and then there are certain standards. Yeah. Um, having said that, you know, whatever your, your internal processing has been, has been used to that over a period of time. Now, yes. there might be certain times in your life where more sleep might be better or you might have disruptions, but you, you don't have a sleep disorder based yeah. on what you've told me. Even if I think I want to sleep more, I'm not able to sleep yeah. more. So that speaks to your rhythm. That's, that's, that's rhythm. how your rhythm works. That's what I keep telling her. That's my rhythm. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm not here to <laughs> I'm not here to take sides or anything. You don't want to referee this? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm not here. That's not my expertise. But, right, but, never, but it gets back to what I said earlier. Everybody is different. So what your complaint may be or what your lack of complaint may be is not the same as your wife's or anyone else's. And so that's why I, I think you have to know yourself. So if there were any changes, let's say you were sleeping too much, then... Uh-huh. Uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, good for you. I mean, if, the, if there were to be any changes, you, you would take note of that. You know yourself well. And I mean, obviously, your wife you know, knows you well, too. But your biology, just maybe your, any your chemistry might just be different. And that's okay. Everybody is different. <laughs> um, but if pain continues to persist or be a problem, there might be some consideration to potentially taking something earlier in the night so you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night. Okay. Good. Can take one more question. Okay. I, I take melatonin at mm -hmm. night, mm -hmm. and I usually take it like um, maybe a half an hour before I mm -hmm. uh, go to bed. Mm -hmm. Now you said uh, you recommend to take it at eight or mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but if I if I took it at eight, I probably fall asleep and not. And, and wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's, that's a common perception. Some would call that a misperception because melatonin is not a sedative hypnotic. It ought not to make you sleepy, so to speak. It's really just to help regulate your inner sleep-wake cycle. And so we generally recommend that, particularly when we're seeing patients in the hospital because their sleep is going to be disrupted, medicines aren't going to get administered on time, et cetera. Even on the outpatient basis, I recommended earlier, because you're adding to the amount that's being secreted at its most. So you're basically adding to that, and then there's this natural cycle of it o over time, you know, coming down and then going back up over the 24-hour circle. It's not meant to make you sleepy. Um, so it's worth a trial, but if you're faring well with your current routine and regimen, there's no consequence, so to speak. You're just getting an additional amount, you know, exogenously through a pill separate from what's naturally being secreted at a later time. But you could trial to see if it affects your sleep taking it earlier. Um, some people do complain that it makes them sleepy or they get more drowsy. I mean, it's not supposed to do that, so to speak, um, because of the way that it works. Um, but like I said, everybody is different. And there's a, there's a book that I didn't include in my slides and didn't mention by the, a neuroscientist. He's a prolific researcher in sleep called Why We Sleep. His name is Michael Walker. Um, if you like to read or you're interested in this topic further, I encourage you to, 
to read it. You, you, look, you look like you've read it. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think about it? I thought it was excellent. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Eye-opening. Yeah. I don't work for him. I'm not promoting it, but I, I thought it was a good book. <laughs> I thought it was worth reading. Oh, that's great. Why We Sleep, and his name is Michael Walker. Is it on Amazon? Yes, it is. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this this evening. Uh -huh. And um, I definitely want to um, thank you again for, for this really, really relevant topic. And I'm like you, I only get four, four and a half hours sleep at night, and I, I hope that that goes on forever. It's been happening since I was about 12. My boss is the same way, yeah. and he's... He's yeah. doing, he's doing okay. If I sleep longer, I think, what's wrong with me? Yeah. What's that? People who are extremely smart and certainly Well, that Sure. Thank you. Their brains, that's what Yeah. Before everybody takes off, I would like to ask you, I did um, put a little questionnaire on your, on your chair. Um, basically, we're just trying to find out if you find these lecture series valuable, um, and then if there are other topics that you'd like to have, we'd really like to know. And because we're a nurse-run supportive care program, we really would like to know if you'd like to utilize having one of our nurses contact you and talk about some of our other wellness programs. Um, you can leave your name, phone number, and email on the back. That's purely optional on your part. Um, our next lecture is still in the process of being worked out, so it, I don't have a topic for it yet. I kind of have an idea, but not, not free to say at the moment. But our next calendar will come out in December. For It'll be for January through June. So again, this is a cancer supportive care program. And um, I will do a little plug for some of the things that you mentioned that were really good for people who have sleep and cognition disorders. We do have um, a lot of relaxation programs. One of them um, you already mentioned was mindfulness meditation. Every Tuesday from 3.30 to 4.30, we have a mindfulness-based stress reduction coach who, who actually is here at the Hoover Pavilion in room 208. And um, it, it gives you an opportunity to learn how to meditate. Talks about mindfulness. So about the first 20 minutes or so is on mindfulness. And then you have 30 minutes of meditation. And it's guided meditation and relaxation. And, and there's so much evidence out there that talks about the importance of meditation when you do have a cancer diagnosis. And as a former caregiver, and for those of you who are caregivers in this room, it's really important for you as a caregiver to take at least an hour for yourself every day to do that, meditate if you can. Um, another thing we can we offer is a journaling class. It's called Writing Your Cancer Journey, but I know that quite a few patients talk about the benefit of journaling, and I think you mentioned this also, not only a sleep journal, but I think a journal also to talk about what you're feeling. You know, whether you do it the first thing in the morning, some people like to do that, they like to journal about their dreams, or maybe in the evening you do a little gratitude like, what are you thankful for for the day? Because sometimes it's important just to think about what happened over the course of the day that made you happy or unhappy. It doesn't have to be always happy. Uh, but we have a wonderful journaling coach, and we offer that program once a month. They're all available on our calendar. And we also have a great healing energy program called Healing Touch. If you haven't experienced energy work before, I truly recommend that you try this. It's definitely... Um, uh, very beneficial for both caregivers and for patients. So, again, this is the Cancer Supportive Care Program. We really appreciate uh, you attending tonight and look forward to seeing you again. Thanks so much. Thank you.